Uh, can you say a bit more about how to stop the thinking process and talk a bit about the cultivation of faith? My aspiration is to be an empty wheelchair. <laughs> So, how to be an empty wheelchair? Well, this, um, can you hear me? Uh, the, um, stopping the thinking process, if you use the sound of silence, that and develop that, then the then the thinking stops, and you're really noticing the the spaces or the emptiness. So that the uh, this is very effective in uh, in stopping these kind of wandering uh, uh, proliferations of the mind. I found that the best the best. I, I've contemplated uh, uh, listening, uh, listening to the silence, or if my emotions are, if I have strong emotions or some emotional feeling, then I, I, I really um, note. I, I sometimes would. I used to listen a lot to what my emotions were saying, just like someone who's just listening, not judging. So that I developed a sense of being a listener uh, rather than the than the emotions. So the emotions were like like voices on the other side of a fence, or just people nattering away, and they get going about what I like and don't like, and what's wrong with this person, and on and on like that. And my determined to to just listen, and then uh, then to um, note that the, these are uh, these are emotional habits. You know, they're they they're impermanent. And by by listening to one's emotional uh, experiences, then you're 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 not just resisting them or uh, Judging them, just determined to be like a, a neutral listener. You need not have any opinion or comment with just one who's paying attention. And then also uh, to listen to the silence, so that the, the and as soon as you put your attention onto the sound of silence, then the thinking process will stop. And and you'll and then you when your thinking process stops, then make a special note. You know, like non-thinking is like this. So that you're you're noticing when when there's thinking and when there's not not thinking. Because we don't usually know the difference. It's usually thinking all the time, and uh, and one thought goes on to another. <clears throat> So, you know, like thinking is, you know, it, one thought will then take on to another thought, and then, and it just proliferates and connects and goes around and around. Where when you're when you're putting your attention on to the here and now, like just the uh, the body or the breath, will stop the thinking. The to whatever is is happening now, you're paying attention, you're watching. You're not thinking, you're just watching. You're observing. And then because, say, with emotions, if you have uh, have uh, emotional experience, and and you uh, and you you know, then the, then the thinking comes from that that kind of energy of the emotions. So, like, if you're angry with somebody. Then the thoughts all come out in angry ways, or so, so like if you 
if you're angry with somebody, then you all those thoughts about that person will be somehow angry, and uh, and 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 then then you you maybe want to stop thinking, and um, and uh, try to get rid of this anger, and that's suppression. So it doesn't suppressing anger still uh, creates anger? I mean, because as long as there's resistance. Uh, out of aversion, out of ignorance, uh, then there's still a karmic connection. So, whether you're indulging in the anger and going on and on about the, what the terrible things this person says and does, or you're trying to stop it, you're still connected to it out of ignorance. So, by adopting an attitude of a listener rather than a judge, so you're not trying to get rid of it. You're not trying to deny it. You're not making any judgments. You're just noticing. Then with the sound of silence, the, the thinking will stop so you can, you can stop proliferating. And then you can feel the energy of that anger, the kind of raw energy that has no thought connected to it. And then as you accept that that feeling of the energy of anger, then it will dissipate and cease. And then you'll feel uh, you'll actually be the witness of the cessation of anger. And you can make a note of non-anger when the, when the anger ceases to make special uh, determination to notice non-anger is like this. So you actually instructing your conscious experience with wisdom. Anger is like this, non-anger is like this. That applies to, to, to emotions. You just try to, like with jitanupasana, with the contemplation of the state of mind, you know, we tend to analyze it. You know, why am I angry? Or, or as long as there's a, we, we think I've got a problem with with anger, or I'm a dosa type. You know, there's three kinds: lopa, dosa, moha. I must be a dosa type, and that that kind of fixes you as a kind of you're permanently kind of dosa type. Where I've got a problem with anger, um, and then you can trace it back to being rejected by your mother or or being abused when you were younger, or, or things like this. So this is, and this this uh, can be, you know, interesting. It's certainly interesting because we we're, we're certainly the product of past experience. You know, there's karma. But in terms of really uh, learning how to deal with emotions in which you're not perpetuating them, not creating more connections to them. It's not through through analysis or identity, but through understanding. They're like this. And so, avoid the identity like, I'm angry. I found that not very helpful. If if there's anger, and oh, I'm angry again. that reinforces the illusion that, that that I'm somebody who's angry, where the actual, more skillful way of thinking about it is there is anger. It's like this, you know. So if, if there's anger, try to try to change even your way of thinking, rather than say my anger, I'm angry. There is because that's an accurate statement, isn't it? There is anger. It's like this. And in that way, you you actually can be aware of it and accept that anger as it is in the present. Then, with the sound of silence, you can you can develop uh, uh, say the stopping thinking about the anger, so you're not proliferating either in analyzing or claiming it or as a personal thing or trying to get rid of it. So you. You're actually accepting it, but you're not thinking about it. But and you're also 
noticing the actual experience as energy, the, the angry state of mind as pure energy, as raw feeling is like this. And in that, then you can feel it, you can actually watch it uh, vanish, because it'll, well, when you accept it, then that, then that mood, that, that energy will, will not be refueled, will not be reinforced, then it kind of dissipates. It's gone. If you're really patient, you can see it go, then, it, then you feel really nice. Where when you're angry and and you're taking it personally, then you think, oh, here I go again. I've got a real problem with anger. And then it seems like despair, like, like you, you know, I've had this problem all my life, and and I'm getting older, but I'm still, you know, this thing still upset me, and and uh, I'm really, you know, it just feels I've tried everything, but nothing works, and go on like that. And you just feel despair and hopeless by, um, by say, habit, m- emotional habit. If you, if you, you know, if you, if you're thinking on, of, if you're identifying personally with them as this is my problem, and I don't want this problem, and then we can blame it on I have this problem because of something, you know that happens or so forth and then, and then but that still that still is uh, is creating and reinforcing the illusion of it as me as a historical person what happened to me when I was one year old is is uh, is the cause of my problem now and it, it, that's reinforcing this whole sense of me as a kind of permanent historical personality. And that's what we assume anyway. We, we assume that, you know, the, the assumptions are, I am, I'm the same person that was born 60, nearly 64 years ago. Now ask yourself, you, you know, you can assume that, you know, they when were you born? I was born in 1934. And uh, I can give you examples of incidents from my life from, from first memories probably around three years old or something that I can recall. And I've got, uh, you know, various... I used to have photographs of me when I was a little child. I don't have them anymore. So there's, there's a, you know, and we do believe in that we are a continuous personality once we're born. But, but like with mindfulness, we're actually observing that personality is something that comes and goes all the time. When, when there's anger in your mind, are you the same person as when you're feeling loving and happy? Or is that awareness, the awareness is the constant thing. That, but that awareness is not personal. That awareness is, is universal. It's not mine. It's not, doesn't belong to me as a person. So that's why awareness uh, is a transcending of the conditions. And, it, and it's not, and that's why it's a nata, it's not a, it, it wasn't born, and and it, and was not doesn't isn't doesn't have any qualities like being male or female or or any generation or any race. That all races, all people have can can use awareness, and that awareness is pure. It's not. It's not. Uh, black awareness or white awareness, <laughs> female awareness. It, it, it is, it is, because you can be aware of those conditions of racial identities or or sexual identities. So 
and in uh, it's to be able to to like like with emotional emotions are very very convincing so so they do have a they're powerful you know so so that we easily uh, believe them but contemplate you know how how people can play on your emotions you know the story about watching in flight films on when I'm traveling and you're sitting there and uh, now they get me flights on in an executive class you get bigger seats and you get your own private little screen the candid little square screen and you pull it out and push a few buttons and then this uh film comes on and, and then they proceed to make you laugh and cry and <laughs> and get excited and, and all this over this uh, cars racing through Los Angeles uh, and people and beautiful women uh, um, being punched in the nose and all this kind of you know, American action films and they then they, uh, and you're sitting there and you're thinking, here I am, you know, high above Kazakhstan. <laughs> and, <laughs> and looking into this little, little square thing, and, and I'm, and I can cry or laugh according to what's happening on this little screen, you know. <laughs> is this, this is emotion. <laughs> You know, you can you can play on people's emotions, yeah. You like uh, demagogues and and dictators and that. They they know how to they know how to get you going, how to make you angry, or how to get your prejudices going, how to hate the Catholics or whatever. And uh, like Ian Paisley, he he's good at that, and. Uh, <laughs> wind you up, you know. How to make you feel sexual desire, or how to how to get you to laugh. So, and 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 we can enjoy this. We like being in these emotions being being used because it, it it makes us feel alive. You know, totally emotionless life. You know, life can be pretty bleak and dull, and uh, a lot of the time. So it, it does. You know, go to a cinema, and you can get you know turned on to some some really passionate scenes and exciting experiences because the emotions are they're just conditioned. They're not. They're not a person. It's not a person. So. But this awareness then is is what you begin to really um, trust in because it you know, like being aware, like practicing awareness while watching this little screen. Then the emotions don't grab hold. You know, if I want to absorb into the into the thing on the screen, then I start feeling the emotions. But if I stay in the silence while watching the screen, then then the emotions aren't aren't being aren't, aren't developing from that because I'm in the silent awareness state rather than absorbed into the activities of these little shadows on this little screen. So, so try that sometime, you know, like with your television. Use the sound of silence and watch some kind of, you know, melodrama. You can you can train yourself to, to. Um, also, with uh, physical pain, it it works well, like and physical discomfort, because when you like, if you're sick or you have been physical pain, then we tend to. Indulge in the pain or resist it. Those are the two. It's either suppressing the pain or indulging in how much we hate it and well, how can we get rid of it. 
you know, and poor me, feeling sorry for ourselves and worrying. But actually, as you, you develop the sound of silence, you can actually, you know, you're aware of the, like, physical pain as sensation, but you're not, but you're not allowing the mind to think about it, but you're accepting the sensation. So then the, without aversion, so that you can actually, uh, can, uh, uh, say, train yourself to, to, um, to not compound the, the physical pain with mental aversion to it. Because that's what's really, that's the stuff that's unbearable. Not, not the actual pain, but the, uh, what we create, what we compound it with out of ignorance. That's why, that's why you can say, I can't take it, I've just had enough, I've had enough. Then you, you can, if you, you know, if you stop going on like that. And I used to, I used to think in the, in the early, years of monastic life in Thailand, you know, you get so exasperated sometimes uh, with things. And I've had enough. I can't take any more of this. I'm going to leave. I'm fed up. Then I noticed that that even after I said that, that I could take more of it. And this thing was, this little thing was just a, you know, it's just a habit, a bad habit. I'm fed up. I can't, I've had enough, I'm leaving. But I never didn't leave. And I, and I, <laughs> and I could take more of it. You know, I can take more of it. I can't believe that. That's just a, some kind of stupid habit I've developed. Then as you, uh, abide in that emptiness then you're 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 just a, then there's an empty wheelchair there's a body the empty body uh, and a wheelchair uh, if you're in a wheelchair then the, there's a body in the wheelchair <laughs> but there's no nobody no body no nobody in the body does that, does that make sense there's no person personality of but there's awareness there's intelligence there's wisdom in the wheelchair <laughs> now this 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 because I found with with um, much of the time in uh like when I first started monastic life, I all I knew how to do was to suppress negative thoughts because that's how my mind worked. You know, you just you just um, you know you resist them, you suppress them, um, and uh, and you, you 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 inspire your mind. So I, at the first, you know, at first, well. Like I found, I I was very inspired by Buddhism and by monasticism, as I saw it in the forest monasteries in Thailand. I was very inspired. I liked it, you know, and I and I felt inspired by it. And so I could overlook a lot of the things, the irritating things of the life at first, because of the inspiration and the and the, and the, of both in Buddhism and in monastic life. But then, and then after a while, the inspiration, you can only go up, feel inspired so long, and then it goes. And then you start noticing all the things you don't like. You know, where before, you, you, when you're inspired, you don't, it doesn't matter, a lot of things you just don't really care about, so you don't pay attention. But when you're no longer inspired, then you, then you become obsessed with with all the irritating things and things you you suddenly make a lot a big issue and create a lot of importance around uh, other things that suddenly and there's no inspiration to to change it so you become you can become very critical you think you know I remember one monk. You know, I first went to Wat Pa Pong, one monk was 
I felt very inspired by this monk. He was one of Ajahn Chah's disciples, and, and you know, I, I just kind of projected, you know, that all the monks, all of Ajahn Chah's disciples were just so wonderful, you know, as, with inspiration. It doesn't discriminate, does it? It just, everything's wonderful. Yeah, all wonderful. And then, then, uh, and then as the inspiration began to fade out, then I noticed things about this monk I didn't like at all. And then the second year, uh, Ajahn Chah took me, a foreign, I was the only foreign monk there, and then he took another monk who, who had been in the, uh, who'd come from a, a monastery in, uh, in the town, and and he was uh, he he was fairly new to the forest tradition. He took us on a kind of uh, journey to meet all the famous teachers in the northeast. So he chose me and this other monk. We went with Ajahn Chah. So this monk that that I was becoming disillusioned with came up to me one day and very bitterly said, "He says I've." I've been Ajahn Chah's disciple for many years, and I've uh, and I've served him, and I've worked hard, but he never takes me on trips like this to <laughs> And and I, I was just so upset by that. You know. I thought surely he should be on these petty jealousies. You know, he should be having mudita for me. You know, glad that you're. I'm so happy. That you're going instead of me. Uh, and this is this is uh, the the mind working, you know, it's becoming. And so I've I've really kind of held on to that memory uh, of you know how disillusioned, disappointed I was, and um, made a, a big thing of it. The. Uh, Then I found that uh, with the, you know, and I could, I could, uh, you know, it's because the monastic life is, uh, say, on a quite a, on a quite disciplined, and it's a brahmachari, it's celibacy, and it, and you, and it's very well supported in Thailand. So you, it, it does carry you along. Uh, in the in the in the convention itself, and uh, and a, and and I could and I like practicing alone. I love solitude because the things that really upset me were people, and <laughs> I didn't like people at all. So so I so I mean I could really. Uh, apply myself to solitude, things like that, and I kept trying to 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 kind of get my way with Ajahn Chah. Trying to, you know, I went up to Tham Sang Pat, this place in the north northern part of Ubon, and and uh, I tried to it's so fix myself up into kind of solitude situations, hermetic styles, and 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 Lung Po Chow always. Wreck it for me. You'd always do something that to to uh, spoil all my plans. And so the um, and but in during this time, you know, I, I I did have a lot of faith in in Ajahn Chah. So I I did question. I was, well, what's he? Why does he do this? You know, what is he pointing to? And then I began to realize that, that my problems really lay not not in isolation or with being alone. I wasn't afraid to live in forests alone. I'm not afraid. I was never afraid of ghosts. Uh, in fact, I'd love to have seen some ghosts. <laughs> Everybody else saw ghosts, but me. And what's wrong with me? Why? <laughs> Why don't they like me? <laughs> and, uh, the uh, the people were the were the things that I found I couldn't stand. 
and uh, and that was a lot of fear around pe- feeling of of just feeling so inadequate and incapable to deal with social relationships and a fear of rejection. And there is a there is a kind of if I go off alone, and then and then uh, and I don't mind being alone. And even, it, you know, you can justify being alone, being a hermit in the monastic life. It's a kind of, you know, it can be praised. People would praise you. They, oh, he's really a good monk. He doesn't socialize. He goes off and practices in the forest. And that's, a, that's like praise. So I can do that. I can get praised by doing that. But then dealing with people was, was, uh, would bring up all kinds of fear and uh, feelings of inadequacy and fear of rejection. And so these kind of emotions were um, were brought forth in through having to live more closely and and intimately with with um, people, with, with other monks in Thailand. So I found in and then in, in England for example where where uh, I've been the the focus of it of a community. You know, it's been it's like my karma. It's uh, it seems to be relentless. You know, I've got to learn this lesson. So I'm really you know I've got to learn how to live with in society in some way. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to be allowed to be a hermit in this lifetime. So that that came, became obvious. So then, then once I accepted that and didn't resist it, then I, then I could be instead of always trying to just sidestep and move away from situations and try to control situations. Then I was more willing to use situations. I found the sound of silence the the biggest breakthrough in that because. Uh, then I could actually begin to to really be more aware of these fears of people without making some kind of judgment about myself or making it in, 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 you know without without making it into like a, a per, you know otherwise I tended to see it as a personal inadequacy. And uh, and a defect in myself, and that always makes you feel, well, you know, I just, I, I, you know, that's the way I'm. I've got to get away. But once I started looking at it in terms of what it really is as experience, and and no longer claiming it in, in a personal way, then then it then I could I found I had ability to resolve these kind of emotional. Uh, habit, fear what, out of what people think, fear of rejection, uh, feeling inadequate as a personality, uh, fear of what people are going to say about me, <clears throat> as self-consciousness. So in, in, in using the sound of silence, I really was able to to learn how to make my feelings very conscious, to bring them, to allow them into a conscious, into consciousness, and then, and not, and to stop the thinking process about them, and be able to relate to the actual experience of that feeling. Once you take the words are gone, then it, there's no self in it. You know, there's nothing, it's energy, you still feel the kind of, like if you're angry, you still feel this kind of this kind of anger for a while, you know. But uh, but it, there's no self in it because you're not thinking. And so then then you can actually once you you learn how to pay attention to the to the angry energy and accept it, you know, not and not think about it. Then it then you're because it is a a vibrating thing that that changes and disappears and go and and ceases, and I found that really is a, like resolves 
emotional habits. The, and like self-consciousness. Yeah? The, uh, I, I know now how not to be self-conscious. You know, I'm sitting here, everybody's looking at me. If I start thinking, then I become self-conscious. And if I go into the silence, then I can, I can relate to you and not create self-conscious feelings in my mind. Because of, of that, that kind of having, investigating, seeing how it works and knowing how my, how experience really is. And then, as it, as you develop it further, then the, then the, uh, subtleties, little subtleties of emotion, you become more, increasingly more aware of, like, nuances and little stuff that you didn't even, you know, you just never, never uh, notice. And then, after a while, you, you, you feel this sense of real, of strength in being, in this, being empty being nobody and a fearlessness because you're not thinking about you you know you become frightened when you start thinking about yourself and uh, then it and uh, but if there's no, if you're not thinking then not, the fear doesn't arise and I noticed you know the story about the I used to tell about uh, being caught in a in the loo with a with a with a ra- uh, angry cobra in Thailand, and uh, <laughs> it went in the the kutis there the hut to have the, the 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 toilet is underneath, you know it's, it's a cement rendered brick with little kind of ventilation uh, bricks and and a door. And and you go and they're, they're quite small. Uh, went there one afternoon into the into this little cubicle. Didn't didn't really look around, and and kind of locked the door. I look, there's this cobra coming at me, and uh, and I was in this this little, tiny little place, and suddenly you know I didn't I instinct. This is quite a revelation because. I don't, I don't remember being frightened. I just, it was the, the, when you're, when death, when uh, there's danger like that, something primordial and instinctual takes over. Because the way I got out of that cubicle (laughs) was, I can't believe it. And, and, uh, and I didn't harm the snake. And, uh, and then when I got outside, I started thinking about it, and I started being frightened. <laughs> so even, you know, like, like even in, in, when life-threatening things, oftentimes the fear comes afterwards, you know, and you, if you start thinking about it, then we, we become cowards through our, through our thoughts. Now, I don't know if this happens on... Uh, every, every life-threatening experience. I just, because I haven't had that many, but I noticed that with this cobra, the closest, you know, that I remember of being, you know, really physically in danger. Um, So the next question uh, is, when Siddhartha Gautama was fully awakened as Gotama the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, he was said to have despaired on behalf of the of humankind immersed in the way of the world at the uh, at the subtlety and complexity of the Dhamma he had discovered. Was it the ignor- was it the ignorance, uh, dependent origination or the nibbana or all of them that is so difficult to apprehend? making the practice of the Dhamma so arduous. Well, this, like, uh, I would say that the Dhamma is 
subtle but not complicated. Because I mean, the condition realm is very complicated. From my experience, I see that it's that the truth is very simple, uh, and it's so simple that that's why we don't notice it. It's uh, because we're complicated, and uh, you know, I just see how complicated. Uh, I mean, some I thought I was complicated, but but being head of a community, I, I some of the members in this community are. Ten times more complicated than I was. So <laughs> I used to think I was really, really complicated. And I uh, began to think maybe I'm, I'm, I'm a bit simple, actually. <laughs> the uh, so and and complicated, like thinking, is complicated, isn't it? memory, self-view is complicated. You know, it's not like like your basic instincts that you can uh, uh, use and, and come from kind of kind of just na- natural conditions. But but modern modern society, uh, we're 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 neurotic. We've got we we we've got all these instincts, but we make endless problems about them. You know, like like sexual desire, for example, is. Now this is a basic instinct in the procreation of the species. It's the deal with it's the body, and it's natural to this state. It's natural to the physical body, and it's uh, and it's a, 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 a pr- primal force. But modern life makes it into such a personal thing. You know, it becomes. Every you know they're selling this Viagra now and uh, these kind of potency pills and and uh, the endless identities with with different types of sexuality and they and uh, uh, and sexual activities and and uh, and the identities and complexities around it uh, where where just the basic normal instinct is isn't really a problem, is it? But as we identify, and we become very complicated, certainly, with all these pedophilias and necrophiliacs and, and, and rapists and, and all the rest, the whole range of identity and complexity around uh, sexual feelings. Uh, so, so this is complicated, uh, like like celibacy is very simple. One time years ago, uh, this this psychiatrist did this uh, did this MMPI or some kind of Minnesota multi personality test on me. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's in Thailand, his American psychiatrist lived in Bangkok, and he he was doing it all. He'd come to the monastery and do it on all the Western monks. So we'd have to ask, like, like there'd be multiple uh, choices, uh, and they say, so you know, being celibate, they'd say, one was, my sex life is, is uh, poor, is, <laughs> is, and he'd have four choices. Uh, last one was, was completely fulfilling. So I wrote, I crossed that one. <laughs> And so he, he asked me, he says, why did, you, why did you check that answer? I said, because that's the way it is. I, I don't have a sex life. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, that's not, so it, my life is perfectly fulfilling, you know. It's not, it's how you want to look at it, isn't it? It's how you want to interpret um, celibacy to me, simplicity, Rather than repression, uh, so it. But I could look at it also as a, as an arduous repression of of uh, instinctual energies. But but as you but as you change your attitude and look at you know you become you know if I was just trying to stop the feelings and and uh, 
repress the whole thing, then then that would be, and that would be very complicated and very kind of, uh, you have a lot of emotional problems around that. But because of the uh, of the meditation where you're actually observing what's happening to you and the energies that you're having, you, you have, you're, you're developing and cultivating uh, and, and, and channeling those energies rather than just resisting and controlling and, and denying. So the the Paticca Samupada, the dependent origination, that is, is, uh, that looks complicated. You know, I remember when I first read it, you know, oh God, look at that, you know, and then the ignorance, conditions, sankharas, karmic formations. What does that mean? You know, the karmic formations condition with consciousness. I don't get the connection there. Consciousness <laughs> to, to uh, nama, rupa, salayatana, pasa, vedana, and on. You know, just even the logic of it and the sequence. You know, it didn't. My mind had never been, never been conditioned in that way. So you know, coming from a Western mind. Uh, that had not, that had not really contemplated or learned how to learn that what that really meant. I, I I have found it hard to get the associations right, and then it ended up, and then the, the then the analoma and batiloma were, and then the, the cessation. You know, and you think. There's no ignorance, then everything ceases, and, and cessation sounded like, like you know, everything collapses, the whole universe would disappear. If you, you know, that's how my how I saw it at first, because I was interpreting from a Western mind, and then then in the meditation, I found I went really into the dependent origination. And and really uh, contemplated it, and um, and and I, because I could see its value lie in it in, in its uh, uh, as a meditation rather than as a kind of Buddhist theory or uh, you know sometimes it's regarded as as a kind of Genesis theory or or creation theory of Buddhism or they they look you know various people have very strong views about how to use this uh, dependent origination. But in terms of, of meditation, I found it really useful because what it did was it really, by contemplating that sequence and applying it to experience in the present, so it's not just abstract, then, uh, then I could, then I began to observe. I saw the insight I had was really the awareness of what is natural to the present moment that I haven't created out of ignorance? It's like, like consciousness is natural to this moment, isn't it? You haven't, you haven't created consciousness. The body, the, the senses, uh, the sensation, all this is, is the way it is in this moment. You know, so you, the breathing, the, the eyes, the ears, the, all the senses and, and the feeling and, and, and that is, is natural to this moment. And if we see it in terms of understanding, then we don't create suffering around it. But if we come from avicca or ignorance, which is basically the sense of self-identity with the condition experience, then then it always takes you to some form of suffering or despair. So, so I began to know that whenever I, you know, if I, if I interpret life uh, uh, on a personal level, I end up always feeling there's something wrong, even when life is going well. 
on the personal level, you know that it's going to change, isn't it? That, that even though everything's all right now, you know it's not going to stay all right. And then, and then it, like in a monastic community, you think, you think, I remember I used to come and say, everything all right? When I come back from these long trips, everything all right? <laughs> I hope everything's all right. And uh, because I was afraid, they say, no, everything's falling apart. And, uh, oh, God, you know. This is uh, this is uh, terrible because uh, it's uh, you know you want you know if, if you say everything's all right, please say everything's all right, even if it's not. <laughs> say it because that'll make me feel okay, you know, as a person, you know, even though everything's falling apart. Don't tell me. Say it's okay <laughs> on the personal level, but. But that's just, you know, deluding yourself and, and kind of avoiding. But, but then, uh, because the conditioned realm is, is about cessation and death. And so it, it's always, it's always this, this angst and sadness in regards to conditioned experience. It's just natural to the, it's, it's a natural, uh, state, you know, because, we're going to be set on the level of condition. Everything that we're attached to and love and identify with, we're going to be separated from. And we, we, know, we know that, really. So, you know, in, in kind of intuitively. But we don't really want to know that. We'd like to have the illusion that, that we're going to live a long time and have a lot of happiness and fulfillment and and everything's going to be okay. And, and the the the, uh, the the self would like, you know, feels all right when you say when you do that. But it's only a kind of okay, all right. It's not, it, you know, there's something unsatisfying about it. So even even if you can delude yourself a lot of the time by pretending everything's okay. When you really look at that feeling, it's based, it's suffering. You know, when you really uh, admit that you're feeling of anxiety and, and they just t- tell me everything's okay, that kind of, that kind of feeling, that, that agitation, when you really see it, is, is the experience of dukkha that comes from ignorance, attachment to desire, Dana Ubadana leads to becoming and, and and rebirth and then from rebirth or becoming and then being reborn again into these conditions then we then we experience their their uh, degeneration into grief, sorrow, despair and anguish, old age, sickness and death. But then, if if you if you if you uh, from a vicha, you use vicha or or right understanding, or vicha is is the is is knowing things in the right way is, is the opposite of ignorance. Then then vicha then the, the thing doesn't uh, once you once you uh, get rid of the vicha then things still operate according to, to you know, all conditions arise and cease, but you know, there's no, there's no uh, self-involvement, there's no, no complicating, compounding anything with, uh, the, uh, with our desires and sense of ourselves. So, but that's something, that's quite, uh, you know, the Paticca Samapar helps to, helps to, to clarify that. And, um, because I I used to feel, where is it? You know, like like I used to take it almost uh, like a, a theory about creation and the universe. That, but it applies to 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 mental experience. It works well when you apply it just to your own mental habits. And it's sort of this like, yeah, consciousness is just normal. You know, nothing wrong with that. It's just functional. But then memories, 
are, are, have a sense of being personal, don't they? I remember when I was in this place, and when I did this, and I remember when you said that to me. And, and so memory is something that you're not, you're not born with, with these memories. They come through experience. And that attachment to an identity with sanya, sanya kanda, and to uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and making a self around the, the, the ability to remember, and uh, then then the tendency to to uh, have ideas, hold on to views and ideas about yourself and the world and how things should be. So once, well, if there's a vicha, then it, then that affects how you interpret experience. It will always be. It will always take you. The result will always be some form of dukkha or suffering. And then once the avicca is relinquished, then the, the using vicha or wisdom, then then uh, you're not creating suffering. Things change according to their nature, but you're experiencing uh, liberation from suffering. So even though the body still gets old and and may get sick, your relationship to the body isn't personal anymore. So you're not creating suffering around the aging or the enervation or we or the sickness of the body. And see, the difference is, is that you, it doesn't mean you never get sick. It was like in the suttas, the Buddha, Buddha, the Buddha got sick and old. And he went through the whole process of the human, human experience. But he never, he didn't suffer from it. Didn't create suffering out of ignorance. Then the, uh, and Nibbana is, is also uh, like that's a, a realization of non-attachment. So you know, to to contemplate experience through through mindfulness, you're observing attachment like this, non-attachments like this. Like in the, in as you as you use the sound of silence, and you you begin to trust yourself to just rest and relax within that state of pure attention and and you don't grasp the idea of I'm paying attention or I have the sound of silence when you, when you let everything go there's this, this, this resonating silence there's no attachment and you can observe and then then you can observe attachment like dhanha ubadana mm. Like like a, a desire is born in your mind, and then you grasp it. You can begin to actually observe that. And uh, I think it's very important to realize that desire is normal in this this realm. This is a desire realm. So we're not trying to get rid of desire. And this is what a lot of people, you know, both Buddhists and non-Buddhists, uh, think about Buddhism is that we're trying to get rid of our desires. Uh, desire to get rid of desire, or that something's bad about desire. But if you really look, what the what it's teaching is that dana ubadana, panchubadana kanda, the five grasping of the five kanda, not the five kanda, that it's the grasping, and so that this ubadana is this is this is really brilliant of the Buddha to point to ubadana because often most people point to maybe desire or hatred as or or anything like this is that you shouldn't have these but but the buddha pointed to grasping these conditions is the problem and that's where you know you can you can always uh uh you know, like, and sometimes I've been really frustrated with, I remember Krishnamurti when he was alive, you know, he'd, 
he would make statements like categorical put downs of religion. You know, though I mean I was there one time at Brockwood and he was he was making fun of people that became religious priests and monks and he was sitting there, you know, everybody looking at it. And and he was he was he was, you know, implying we were all stupid and attached to a lot of hocus pocus. And then he made some insulting remark about the Pope who had just been somebody tried to murder the Pope that week, you know, when he was shot. And uh, and so I was so I you know, I felt quite irritated with him and because I used to be very, used to be quite a strong Krishnamurti uh Krishnamurti height which he didn't like that term but but then I realized that you know like Krishnamurti seemed to, to have this idea that religion or being a monk or a priest or wearing robes or meditation techniques or scriptural teachings all this was just uh, you know just a waste of time and uh, this was blindness and stupidity and and he was you know for this awakenness so he, in some ways you know Buddhists could relate to, to his teaching but he never got to the subtlety of of Upadana because it's not monasticism or religion it's the grasping always that's the problem. You know, it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's as simple as that. You, these things are, you know, how you use the robe. You can become, you know, you can. I could become a, you know, easier to shave your head, get a get a ordination, and and then uh, just use it for for the wrong reasons. And then you could then you say, see, Buddhist monks are just selfish and corrupt. Look at Sumato. <laughs> See, I proved my point. Religion is a waste of time. It's an opiate of the people. And then you point to all the ones that Ajahn, what's the one that entirely the Yantra, you know. <laughs> And in Thailand, they'd say when the Ajahn Yantra was being, was, was, when that scandal broke loose in Thailand, all the all the religions degenerating, Buddhism is falling apart. And everybody's going on like that, and then the, and the the wise monks would say, "No, it's not. It's not the Buddhism that doesn't degenerate. It's people <laughs> and and the grasping of you know." The, the convention itself is what you make of it. So, like with Buddhist monasticism, if you if you're using it to develop mindfulness, then it's very useful. But if you know, if I'm using it as a you know a kind of I'm a Buddhist monk and 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 I'm becoming conceited, you know, I think well I'm I'm very important Buddhist monk and I'm been a Buddhist monk for thirty years and I'm uh, I'm, you know, then then I'm using it to uh, as a grasping thing. Then it becomes repulsive, you know. And Krishnamurti was was also, you know, you felt his kind of frustration that people were always grasping what he was saying. You know, sometimes you get this kind of desperation in his voice. Can't you see? <laughs> <laughs> Like like the life of Brian, that Monty Python uh, <laughs> film, where where uh, they all the crowds are saying to Brian, "Is it you're the Messiah? You're the Messiah?" And he he says, "I'm not the Messiah." And he says, "See, he's the Messiah because only the Messiah would say he's not the Messiah." <laughs> <laughs> So it's the grasping, uh, that, and that 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 apply that to, uh, you know, to just the grasping of the idea that 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 nibbana is very difficult, makes it 
makes Nibbana something that we, we've already conditioned our mind to perceive is extremely difficult. But if we, but if we, if we, uh, if we look at our own tendency to form opinions and, and cling to views and opinions, then, then you, then you're actually right in there where the, what with the, with the, you know, noticing desire and attachment as you're actually creating it. And then you begin to, you know, insightfully recognize the suffering that you're creating through, through attachment. So even attachment to something very good is is suffering, like like attachment to morality, for example. Morality is good, but attachment to morality, you can become uh, very uh, judgmental and look down on other people who are who are immoral. You can become uh, very rigid and inflexible, you know, about everything, so that you, because you're very attached to moral principles, and, and then you, 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 through that attachment, you feel you're somehow much better than people who you consider immoral. And, and so it creates a whole sense of yourself through attachment to something good. But it's not morality that the problem, it's the attachment to it. Then the opposite is, is like, well, let's not have any moral principles. Let's just be free, you know. And uh, because look at those moralistic people; they're all uptight, neurotic, and unpleasant, you know. And they're always passing judgments and telling you what you should be doing. And let's just chuck it all in and and just enjoy, you know. Zorba the Greek, just dance and drink and and have fun all the time, no moral boundaries whatsoever. And the attachment to that view also takes you to suffering. So the, 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 so the, the attachment out of ignorance, like avicca, dana, ubatan, dukkha, that's like Patitsa Samupada, if you simplify it. Ignorance, uh, desire, attachment, result, dukkha. Mm-hmm. And this you, you, you reflect upon and, and can see it, can actually insightfully uh, realize uh, that it's a, uh, attachment to conditions out of it. Not even attachment to <coughs> conditions like, you, you know, uh, out of wisdom. Sometimes we need to attach to things. You know, we need to, you know, hold on to things, uh, but we know what we're doing. It's not out of ignorance and habit, and, and uh, so it's 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 the avich is the is the is the is the focus, avicha, dukkha, and then dana ubadana is what we what we tend to be doing in the present, out of avicha. Like in, in uh, uh, I had a lot of insight in the second noble truth years ago through, through uh, Whippawadanha, desire to get rid of things. Because I had a lot of, I had a lot of that desire to get rid of bad thoughts. And they, that seemed good, isn't it? That you should get rid of bad thoughts. So the, so that you know, there's always this. So trying to get rid of bad thoughts, attachment to this desire to get rid of bad thoughts, always create dukkha. And then contemplating vipavadana, there's the three kinds of desire: kama dana, pawa dana, vipavadana. That vipavadana desire to annihilate or get rid of. Then I could see that. I could really relate to that as experience. How much of my life has been trying to Dismiss, deny, get rid of, suppress, run away from things. That that I was very much a Vipawadanha uh, program. And the uh, and once I could really 
uh, recognize that. I could see, you know, just I don't want this. I don't. I don't like this, and it shouldn't be like this, and and oftentimes around things that that were, you know, in one way it's true, you know, it shouldn't be like this. But that attachment to the desire to get rid of was the problem. So, I'm glad you all had a chance to ask your questions. (laughs) 